everyone. Uh, welcome to the WS2 webinar on frictionless adoption of payment services directive with WS2 solutions. I'm Pushpalanka Jayavadana, a senior software engineer working at WS2 uh, in the identity and access management domain. So let's start with uh, what WSO2 is first, if you haven't worked with WS2 yet. So WSO2 is a company founded in 2015 and we have nearly 500 employees and nearly 300 engineers working on different enterprise solutions. And we have nearly 400 customers and we have global offices in United States. United Kingdom, Sri Lanka, and we are a 100% open source company. Our all source is uh, publicly available in GitHub, and our products are deployable on premise and cloud for to cater enterprise solutions. These are the major focus areas of WSO2. As of now, we have solutions for API management, integration, identity and access management, smart analytics, and IoT. When we think of Payment Services Directive 2, major solutions we are focusing will be API management, identity and access management, and some of the cases we might need integration solutions as well. So we will look into details how these uh, WS2 solutions can be used in catering the requirements defined in Payment Services Directive 2. So this is the overview I have for this webinar. Uh, first I will look into the background of Payment Services Directive to understand what this is and what are the effects and objectives. Uh, they have in mind when this regulation is taken into discussion and most importantly the security implications of this directive which is the widely discussed topic relevant to PSD2. So when it comes with the security, the WS2 solution we have in the direction of security is WS2 identity server, the identity and access management solution we have. I will briefly describe the objectives we have in this product and the heart of WS2 Identity Service Application Authentication Framework which will provide most of the functionalities required by PSD2 specification. And I will try to demonstrate few of these capabilities uh, along with WS2 Identity Server and API Manager, how both these product together can cater for requirements defined in Payment Services Directive 2. So PSD2 is a uh, new regulation defined for European region. Previously we had PSD and this is the successor of it uh, which has few more modifications, enhancements I would rather say. And this uh, second version is published in 2016 January and is expected to become a law by 2018 January, less than a year ahead. So the effect of this is mostly on payment service providers like card networks and banks and there are indirectly affected areas like telecommunication. This directive enforces security mechanisms uh, on how customers access payment services and how the payment service providers expose their services. So this directly affects when third party providers access account and transactional data of customers and when the customers make and authorize payments on behalf of merchants. In the PSD2 directive, the security implications are mostly discussed under Article 98 and these were further elaborated with regulatory technical standard published recently as the final, uh, as the final draft. So it will be 
it, it helps some guidelines on how how these security requirements needs to be met. So let's try to understand the objectives and effects of this directive. So this diagram shows uh, before PSD2 flow and after PSD2 flow. So the gray areas will be the uh, flaws that will be eliminated with PSD2 standard. So before PSD2, we we didn't had this PISP and AISP. PISP is payment initiative service provider and AISP is account information service provider. Before PSD2, we considered both of these parties as just payment service providers. And at that level, when a customer want, want to make a payment to a merchant, so the merchant will initiate the payment which will go through PSP, then acquiring bank, then to the card network, then to the issuing bank and the issuing bank will be then again responding to card network, then to the acquiring bank, then to the PSP and PSP will respond to merchant. So this has several hops to go on and it indicates there is a considerable fee involved with the parties in the flow. And since there are several security hops, uh, there are several other negotiations and coordinations that needs to happen. With PSD2, PSP is separated into two aspects with PISP and AISP and the other hops are removed so that merchant will directly call the PISP in case of initiating a payment or in order to get account information it will directly call AISP and the issuing bank then will reply to the merchant without going through the hops like card network and acquiring banks. So this direct communication is going to make the services much more effective and uh, the uh, fees involved can be expected to be reduced. Also this uh, require that the banks expose open APIs in order to initiate payments and account information services. We will look into those details in the coming up slides. So let us focus more on to the security impl implications of this directive. The most widely talked factor is two-factor authentication. So this is known as a strong authentication also. So what is this two-factor authentication? It is a subset we have from multi-factor, multi-option multi authentication. What this says is we have to at least consider two factors of the authenticating party. These two factors can come from knowledge factor which is something the user know like username, password or for a PIN number or it can be something in possession by the user like mobile, a security device or some token generator and this can also be some inherence factor like bi biometric parameters like fingerprint, voice, iris pattern, etc. The directive also discusses of uh, adaptive authentication. So what this says is, uh, let us take an example like a user is going to do a transaction that involves a huge amount of currency. So at that level, the authentication mechanism needs to be much strict. And if the amount is much low, we won't need such much strict authentication and maybe the user's uh, usual login location has changed to some another country. At that level, we may need some further authentications from the user, but without compromising users, user experience. 
It also discusses about access delegation with explicit user consent. As the directive talks about account information exposing from banks, they specifically mention that this should be done under the user's consent. So that user should explicitly say that they are okay with sharing that information with that third party. Fine grained authorization is another aspect that is implied with the PSD2 directive. So what this means is when we come to authorization, we usually look at what are the roles this user has and the permissions involved with that role. But when we go beyond that, there are use cases where just a role can't handle. Let's say we want to restrict opening an account by user's age and the uh, options available for that user with the with some other attributes like uh, user's job, uh, its uh, transactional history, and maybe we want to lock user accessing the system for a particular time in a day. So that kind of fine-grained authorization policies we can we can introduce into the system with PSD2 directive. And major thing we want to note here is that these fine-grained authorization policies are closely coupled with the business decisions. So this needs to be easily and dynamically modifiable. So we will need to make a note of that too. The next thing is open secured APIs. So as we discussed previously, PSD2 directive enforces banks to expose uh, the data they have as APIs. This may be account information or payment services initiations. Since this is very critical data that we are handling at that level, these APIs needs to be much secured. And we need to keep track of who is accessing these and uh, the accessing patterns and any fraud detections and audit logs uh, are a must to cater for these secured requirements. So now we know what are the security implications we have in PSD2, PSD2 directive, what we have to do in order to adopt this. Then let's see what are the available technologies that we can consume in order to cater for these security requirements. The RTS is itself explicitly mentions that we have to based on known standards in catering for these security requirements. So the first thing we have is user's authentication. When we look at this domain, we can see two major open standards that are widely adopted and used. We have SAML 2.0, which is a, a single sign-on protocol, and OpenID Connect, which has recently gained the hype. And uh, both of these can cater for single sign-on scenarios. So PSD2 is not directly talking of single sign-on. But when we look at how this will be adopted in the domain, in order to cater for users, user experience, we may need it. If we take a sample web application that will act like an account information service provider, which will provide a single view for the user about multiple accounts that user has in different banks, this user needs to log into multiple accounts. But if all of these banks have some common identity provider, the users can log into banks maybe one time when they first log in, but afterwards they might be able to consume a single sign-on scenario without compromising the user's experience. 
and there may be federations avail available in these flows as there will be multiple partners working and they might be working on different protocols. One bank may be using with uh, SAML 2.2, some other bank will be letting users get authenticated with OpenID Connect and we might need some coordination between these two protocols in single sign-on flows. The next thing we talk is access delegation that users letting some third party application to retrieve details from banks on behalf of onself. So for that or 2 is the well known standard we have which is widely used nowadays that also provide uh, capabilities to take users consent on whatever to be shared. When we take fine grained authorization, so most of the cases we try to move forward with role based authentication, but when it becomes more complex and needs to be much dynamic, what we have is the SACML standard which is the de facto standard we have for fine grained authorization. So whether to go with SACML or whether to go forward with OAuth scopes or just be satisfied with role based authentication is up to a decision now on what, what level of authorization we need and what, what level of dynamic modifications we expect to these authorization policies. The major thing we discussed on PSD2 is multi-factor authentication of course. So for that as we discuss we need to consider two factors from knowledge factor, position factor or inheritance factor. In that most probably in most of the cases uh, what we look for is uh, position factor like users mobile or some token generator or a security device. So in that case we have SMS one time password and Fido Alliance has uh, several specifications on this and Duo, MePin are some other available options to go for in multi-fact authentication special, especially with position factor. So I mentioned that uh, WS2 identity and access management solution, WS2 identity server has capabilities in order to support PSD2 directive. So I will further elaborate on this. In So as, uh, as we can see multi-factor authentication is the uh, vast modification we have with PSD2. So what WS2 identity server has in order to cater for this multi-factor multi-option authentication. So we have a uh, ecosystem with uh, 40 plus connectors available with uh, options to consider multiple factors at authentication. So we have an authenticator for MePIN, SMSOTP, FIDO, DUO and much more. So I can show this uh, IS connector store we have and the options we have there. So this is the IS connector store we have. As you can see there are several authenticators available here. We have Fido authenticator and there are RSA authentication available and we have Duo security authenticator which can be used with uh, multi-factor authentication and this is SMS OTP, TOTP and MePIN authenticator is also there and we can write any custom authenticators if there is a requirement and it is not available in connectors to as of now. And WS2 identity server supports uh, standards like SAML 2.0 or 2.0, OpenID Connect, SACML 2.0 and 3.0, 
and scheme standard for user provisioning. So, we have comprehensive support for all these specifications which I will demonstrate in a minute. And WS2 identity server has comprehensive support for user management, managing the users that are stored in a user store maybe that can be a open LDAP kind of LDAP user store or active directory or a JDBC user store. We can plug that user store as it is to WS2 identity server and manage the users from IS itself. And we can work with multiple user stores plugged into the server and provide a unified view. And these are also hot deployable so, so that server restarts are not required. Then we have a federation framework which is the heart of WS2 identity server and it caters for multi-factor authentication and multi-option multi authentication. It manages user provisioning and it can do the protocol mediations like uh, from SAML to OpenID Connect and from OpenID Connect to SAML uh, or any other protocol and any other proprietary protocol mediations that can be handled by federation framework. Double Star Identity Server also has support for workflows. So, if you take an example, if, uh, if there is a user who is going to be added to the customer base with some high amount of uh, deposit, maybe there is a workflow we need to trigger that if the deposit amount is above this value, we need to have an approval from some higher rank official. In that case, we, we can set up a workflow in WS2 identity server at the user flow and get that human task triggered. Identity server also has uh, comprehensive support with uh, identity analytics server which has uh, all the analytic capabilities that also I will uh, show in the later half of the webinar. As I mentioned previously, this is the heart of WS2 identity server with which caters for multi-factor, multi-option authentication while doing protocol mediations and handling provisioning of users. I will just explain a bit of this diagram and how this architecture works so that we can understand the flaws we have later in comprehensive manner. So, we have service providers here. So, this we, this will be the web applications users are directly accessing. So, these web applications can be having different ways of di different mechanisms of authenticating and authorizing users. For example, this can be apps, web apps developed by banks. They may be using SAML SSO or OpenID Connect, OpenID or some other their own protocol to authenticate users. But now with PSD2, they might want to talk with other applications and maybe other applications want to access their applications also. So, the this user base can be from some other external identity provider that can be some other bank or some third party service provider. In that case, if that external party is not supporting the exact protocol used by the service provider, we need someone to do the mediation in the middle. Let us assume that the service provider is working with SAML SSO and this external party is only working with OpenID Connect. So, at that case, WS2 application authentication framework can sit in the middle and do the protocol, do the protocol mediation from SAML to OpenID Connect and OpenID Connect to SAML. And at this layer, authentication framework can also enforce multi-factor and multi-option authentication. 
So, when that request comes from service provider, we can configure this framework to provide the user with multiple challenges. Like, user will be given multiple steps to go through and each step ha can have multiple options to select for user. So, that is the configuration we can govern on how we need these users to get logged in. And apart from those, if we need some other intercept, intercept, intercepting mechanism that may do some authorization or if we need to uh, get the users provide some more details to us. So, we can intercept this flow in the middle of authentication framework and trigger such custom flow as well. So, this is a more focused uh, diagram I have on how we can uh, use the mentioned standards and authentication mechanisms in PSD2 relevant flow. I will start with how the user will log into the system and the further proceedings will go through. So, here I have assumed two banks, ACD bank and City bank. So, this uh, City bank is working with OpenID Connect protocol and I have assumed that Z bank is working with SAML 2.0 protocol. So, with PSD2 directive with enforcing multi-factor authentication for customer authentication, both these banks are using some other multi-factor authentication token as well. And each of these banks have their own APIs which they have to expose as open APIs now with PSD2 enforcement and these APIs need to be exposed in a secured manner. So, let us look into this account information service provider application. This is where now the user will be logged into and user's intention is to have a unified view of all the accounts he has in different banks. So, in order to provide that unified view, this account information service provider application needs to know a way it can access these secured APIs provided by these banks and that will be done on behalf of this of this user. So, let us see how this flow would work. This user will come to the AISP application and user decides that he want to link a Z bank account to this application for his unified view. At this level, AISP application will direct the user to AZ bank IDP where user will enter username, password though and uh, multi-factor authentication token to AZ bank IDP and get properly authenticated. So, as a reply this IDP will provide the SAML response to this AISP application. AISP application will validate the SAML response and let the user logged in so that AISP application now have a valid SAML response. But now, how this application call the secured API of this Z bank? For that, we have SAML2 bearer grant type we have for auth tokens. So, what this AISP application can do is send that SAML2 bearer token to the IDP of Z bank and request the auth token. And afterward, this AISP application can use that auth tokens to call these secure APIs and retrieve users account information to the application. Then how, how would this user link the Citibank account to the AISP application? At that level also, user will have to first time log into this Citibank account. So, user will be directed to Citibank IDP 
and their user will provide username and password and the multiple factor authentication mechanism details. Once the user is authenticated properly here, this AISP application will receive a ID token from Citibank IDP. So now AISP has a valid ID token which carries the user's data and some other attributes along with it. So now this AISP application needs to get an access token that is valid to access these secured APIs of Citibank. In order to do that, there is another specification men mentioned as JWT Briara grant type which will take the ID token and provide the auth token for the requesting party. So with that, ASP application can call these APIs and retrieve the account details of this user to provide a unified view of account information. Then let us move on to fine grained authorization we have mentioned from PSD2 directive. So there are two flaws we have where we can intercept the flaws for fine grained authorization. First one is in the authentication flow when the user get authenticated providing multi factors we may need to, we may need to do further uh, authentication let us not say that is authentication as this is after users uh, authentication we are going to do fine grained authorization. So it is basically affecting users login function. Let us say we have some one hour time interval maybe once a week that we do some sanity checks or uh, some task in the system that we want to block users from getting logged into the system between this time interval. So this is some decision that might change frequently and uh, that needs to be executed for every login users will trigger. So at that level we can have fine grained authorization. So we can intercept the user's login flow and after authentication we will trigger a fine grained authorization check uh, which will be done through SACML standard protocol and that will decide whether to perm permit or deny the login of the authentication authenticated user. The other location we can enforce fine grained authorization is at API calls. When the AISP application calls banks APIs at that level while checking uh, for OAuth2 token we can also do a check for fine grained authorization. So at that layer the API management solution will intercept the flaws, generate a SACML request and send it to a policy decision point like WS2 identity server get the decision according to the defined policies whether to uh, let the user proceed with the API call or not and how the fine grained authorization applied there. So one use case we can think of how this will be useful is let us say there is an API which provide all the options we will show in a web app one after the other after each click we might be uh, providing the UI for each user. Let us say we have uh, different tiers of users platinum, gold and silver and for platinum users we want to show op options to take online loans but for gold and silver users we do not need to allow that option. So there is a uh, you, you, that UI is decided on what is the tier of these users. So that kind of authorization can also be supported with SACML. So SACML has another uh, profile named multiple decision profile and hierarchical resource profile. So using the, those profiles we can cater for some uh, requirement like this. 
So, with that I will uh, demonstrate uh, few of the discussed functionalities. So, first let us go to I am logging into it now. So, this is user management view we have as you can see I have several users here. So, and I can update users informations. Uh, I will show the admin user. For admin user I have filled this information here. Let us look into our SAML sample. So, I am going here, clicking here. Okay. As you can see, now I am in WSO2 identity server and I am trying to log into my application. So, I have provided my username and password. So, this is the second factor. So, now it is asking me to enter the code I have received on my mobile. Okay, I have got it. Let us see. Okay, I have got my second factor in my mobile. I have entered it. Now, let us see. Okay. So, now I am authenticated. I have completed two factors. So, this was done in SAML. This was done under SAML 2.0 protocol. If I can show. Here I have received the SAML response. If we decode this, we will see user attributes and uh, sign decision is available in this SAML response. So now the application has a valid SAML response. As I discussed with the slides, given that uh, SAML response, I can request a OAuth2 token from a trusted IDP. So I have added WS2 identity server itself as a trusted IDP for this application's IDP. So, now I am going to request a OAuth2 token with that previously highlighted SAML response. Okay. I have received it. So, I have access token, refresh token and expiry time is there. Now, since I have a valid access token, this application can now call any secured API that is secured with this IDP. So, that is SAML bearer token flow. Similarly, we can go with JWT bearer token flow. It is very similar to this. Only difference is in spite of SAML, we have open ID connect. Then let us look into the API security flow. So, for that uh, we have this sample, the, P, the RTS mentions of uh, authorization code flows we can use here. I am going to go with authorization code flow in WS2 identity server. I have added this service provider here and open ID connect configuration is here. I am going to get the client ID provided it. I am going for the open ID scope as I would like to have users attributes. This is the callback URL I have for this web application. This is the authorized endpoint of WS2 identity server. At this moment I am not going forward with PKC so I am not providing it. Okay, so 
Now this is the consent page we have for user. We are asking user that this application is requesting your profile information. What would you do? At this level we can also list down what are the profile information we are sending in order to get the user consent. Let us say user approved this. Now I have received the authorization code. Next I have to provide this authorization code and get the access code according to the OpenID Connect flow. Requesting access token. Okay, I have got it. So now I have a valid access token and this token has OpenID scope which means I can request users information. This is the user info endpoint we have in WS2 identity server and I am requesting users information now. Okay, here I have got subject is admin and admin's roles. Admin's email has not verified that is just another user attribute of this user and admin's email is this. So, with this I would have received the ID token as well which I can use in where grant here in order to get the auth to access token. So, next I would like to show how this configuration is done, how I reached, ok I am going to get the incognito window as the session is still there. So, here I am seeing two options for user to lo get logged in. The basic authentication providing username password or they have the option to log in with Facebook. So, this is a multi option login page and only when the user adds the username and password, user gets into the second factor and the second factor authentication is only having one option. So, we'll, I will show how this configuration is done in WS2 identity server. So, this is the service provider that is relevant with uh, the service, uh, the web application I logged in. So, there are the inbound authentication configuration is done as SAML web SSO and in local and outbound authentication I have done a advanced configuration. Here you can see we have two steps. This is the first option basic authenticator where I saw fields to add my username and password. As you can see Facebook was the other option I saw in the login page. So user can proceed with either of these options and uh, successfully pass the step 1. After it is passed, user is taken to step 2 and in step 2, I have only added federated authentication with SMS. So, how does this SMS authentications are configured? These are identity providers we have. So, Facebook authentication IDP is there, SMS is there. And here, in SMS authentication, I have configured SMS OTP configuration. So, these are the available federated authentications we have available in the system. If I have installed more authenticators from this available IS connectors, I would see them here. So, I have added SMS OTP authenticator and I have configured it here. So, that is how I get the into the step 2. Okay, so that is with uh, how federations and multi factor authentication has worked. Next, I will show how, uh, how we have API security provided with API manager. So, we have a publisher component where we can add APIs. I have already added the bank API and published it here. This is my service 
uh, which list down the account options and let the users credit into the account. I have published this in our publisher. If I show the details of this, at designing phase, I have defined these two resources where accounts and account credit functionality is there. And at implementation, I have provided the uh, actual server in uh, actual service endpoint. And I have an entitlement mediator in the middle. So, I am going to demonstrate how APIs are intercepted in the middle when they are called for fine grained authorization. And I am going with unlimited tier, so I can do any number of requests and I have published this API. So, this is available in WS2 API store as a published API now. So, this published API, I have registered the bank application in WS2 API store and this API is getting subscribed by that application. Okay. So, I am going to generate a token and access this applications API. This is the bank API. I have the two resources I have running here. I am going to call it with banking app. Okay, let us have a try and see. Okay, it says invalid credentials, which seems the access token is expired. So, I will go and regenerate it. It is the banking app. Yeah, I can generate a new access token. It is generated. I am going back to APIs, bank API. And in API console, I am going to call it using banking. It will auto populate this. Okay. Now I am getting this SAS response which says user is not authorized to perform this action. This is because I have fine grained authorization active in this setup now with the entitlement mediator. So, what this entitlement mediator does is intercept this API call in the middle and it creates a SACML request which is sent to the WS2 identity server and in return it get the response and according to the decision whether it is permitted or denied, it will let the user proceed to the API or block it there. I have a policy added in WS2 identity server. I will show that. So, this is the policy inactive in the PDP. What it does is, it is applied to any API request going to account resource and if the action is a get and if the time is in between 15 and 17 only, it will be permitted. So, what I will do now in order to get this permitted is differentiate this time as I get permitted. So, what I will do is I am going to leave this as so my current time is 14. I am saving it, publishing it to my PDP. I should see that modification here now. Okay, it's effective there. And let's call my API again. Okay, so at that time I'm permitted. So likewise, with that SACML policy we have here, we can permit and deny API calls as we wish, and this policy is written with. SACML 3.0 standard. So, that basically concludes what I, what I expected to demonstrate on this. Uh, 
since analytics not I will not be able to collect here I have uh, gathered it uh, with uh, WS2 identity server analytics we have two main categories login analytics and session analytics so with login analytics we can track uh, successful and failed login attempts we can filter out those whether they are local login attempts or federated login attempts so that filtering capability is also there in addition we can see uh, currently available active sessions and how long those sessions have been active etc which will be like this uh, this is filtering uh, the data with uh, role and by user stores whether from LDAP Active Directory or some other user store how the logins authentications have been successful and failed by users by role by user stores so and uh, with the locations we can also analyze these uh, details with graphs in WS2 identity server this is uh, the reference architecture we would have for PSD2. If I brief again, banks might have multiple services available for them. Some of these services may be working with legacy systems. In that case, in order to expose those SaaS APIs, we might need some heavy mediations. In that case, we would use a enterprise integrator solution uh, like an ESB and after that we will be able to do the API management with WS2 API manager which will do throttling with traffic manager, monitoring aspects and handle the API security aspects and provide the ecosystem to publish APIs and let the, uh, let the application developers to get subscribed to those APIs etc. And after API manager do this management those APIs can be used by the mobile clients, web clients or any other applications developed to be consumed by users or employees. And at both these level, levels, at API manager and uh, application level, authentication and authorization can be delegated to WS2 identity server to take care of. So that basically concludes the uh, webinar flow. And we will have an article published uh, in next week also uh, with the details we have here and uh, the scenarios we demonstrated. We will be having those documented in an article uh, for your reference. So thank you very much for attending the webinar and uh, you can uh, send over if there are any questions or further clarifications needed. We will be sharing the slides too. Thank you very much.